Hey, and welcome back everyone to our Orboot hacking streams. So for today, uh, I have prepared a few things. Um, so we're going to uh, really head on very quick today and uh, look into something called Linux boot that I already introduced a bit earlier. Um, but the uh, main point today will be uh, that we're going to skip past a lot of the firmware things uh, that we had been dealing with. So uh, we're not going to look much into our boot today. Um, I will do a bit of a recap. Uh, but yeah, the main goal will be to actually look at the platform from a different perspective, namely from the operating system uh, when it's already booted and passed the firmware. So that should allow for uh, checking on whether everything is set up correctly. And we might also, uh, you know, wish to play around a bit and uh, yeah, see what else we may be able to discover. So we had already seen that the documentation uh, on the SOC that we're on is quite sparse. So uh, we don't get to see much there. And we may need to get most of the clues from the actual drivers that are in Linux currently uh, or in the vendor's fork of Linux um, or in their fork of Uboot and so on. So uh, one thing I would like to introduce first though is one of the tools that we're going to use and uh, that's the CPU tool that is already uh, visible here. Uh, this is the project website, so it's uh, really just the repository on GitHub. And what CPU is, um, well, uh, first of all, it's a command. It's coming from uh, another operating system called Plan 9. That was one of the research operating systems uh, back in the 90s, uh, which was mainly done by the uh, people from Bell Labs, you know, after they had uh, worked on Unix, they wanted to do something uh, fresh again. Uh, and then later on, the project was still picked up in a few places, uh, one of which I just coincidentally also ran into. Um, and that will, uh, yeah, that will be something uh, we will see in a bit also. Um, Anyway, so yeah, uh, first let's uh, see a bit what this command does and what it's for. Um, so in the Plan 9 world, uh, the idea was actually that you would be able to access all the resources in your machine, but not just your machine. Um, your system would actually be the whole network. So essentially, uh, you know, you would just use all the other machines that are in your network as if they were just your machine, right? So that it just expands naturally like uh, so currently, uh, when you, let's say you have a desktop machine uh, and you want to access, you know, lots of different interesting peripherals, uh, usually you, you know, you would just cram in expansion cards, maybe upgrade your CPU at some point or, you know, buy a more powerful GPU. So, you know, if you want very fancy graphics, uh, you want to play the latest video games and so on. Uh, but the point is you can only scale this to a certain degree, right? At some point, the machine will just be full. You know, the processor is only running at some maximum clock speed, whatever is the latest processor available at that point. Um, so if you want to make use of more compute resources, uh, you would need to have more machines essentially. Or, well, in the server systems, uh, it's also that you typically find uh, multiple CPUs uh, in one system. So the CPUs are interconnected. Uh, similar to uh, how the cores within one CPU can be interconnected. Um, but still, uh, you would hit the limits at some point and then, you know, the only way to expand again would be to have more machines. And one of the fast interfaces between the machines is, well, the network that we put between them. So usually that would be Ethernet. Today we're up to gigabits or, uh, you know, two and a half gig is uh, one common thing that you can already find for uh, not such a high price even, and so on. And so now coming back to the CPU command, the idea is that uh, you could just import a CPU from any machine and use it as, you know, if it was on your local system. And now what this allows for is uh, you can do very heavy computation tasks, right? So like, uh, let's say you want to compile a program that is very large, like a web browser, for example, if I were to compile, let's say, Chromium on uh, my laptop machine here, uh, that would probably take like half a day maybe, uh, just because it's so many files that would need to be compiled. And if I could distribute that, then I could do it very, very efficiently. 
out of a sudden. I mean, you would still need to synchronize, of course, and so on. Uh, but that's only one example. There are many other things you could do. Um, and now the uh, next thing, uh, and that's the feature we're going to use of CPU is, uh, you can also uh, access everything else, like the peripherals and so on. So uh, we're going to see that we get CPU D, that is the daemon for CPU, on the Vision 5 board. And then we're going to take a look at the system over the network. So I don't need to always, uh, you know, use the same uh, console that we've been using up until now to, you know, interact with the system. Uh, but I can do everything remotely then. So it's a bit like an enhanced version of SSH, if you will, uh, because here is now the core difference. Uh, with SSH, you would just run remotely already existing programs, right? So you would SSH to a machine. If something doesn't exist, what would you do? You would install it there. Uh, but with CPU, you don't need to do this. You can just bring the programs that you already have on your host machine and run them on the remote machine. And now I hope that we will get to this point. Um, if not, then uh, we will resort to having a look at a virtual machine uh, where I've also, you know, set up a RISC-V system already. So, you know, that it's sort of similar. Anyway, um, so yeah, a, a brief history of uh, what we've been uh, doing with this uh, CPU command here uh, that Runminic ported to the Linux operating system. Um, you know, I have a bunch of gadgets here, uh, some of which are cameras, some of which are, you know, wireless storage devices or uh, network video recorders and, you know, all sorts of things. And well, um, some of them were these uh, small little robots. Well, they're not even that small, actually. It's more like uh, this size, so roughly the size of my head, maybe. Um, and what I did was uh, I put the CPU daemon on them uh, and ran them over Wi-Fi, right? So I could just remotely connect to them. Now you see those wires uh, up there in their heads. Uh, this is how I got the serial console. Um, but yeah, once I had CPU D running, I didn't need that anymore. I could just put that thing somewhere on the shelf, you know, and then remotely connect it and do whatever. Um, and I didn't have to reflash anything like, you know, a new image uh, or something. I didn't have to transfer around SD cards and so on. I could just bring all the applications that I needed. Um, now, if you've come uh, from, you know, a different angle, let's say you've done uh, embedded Linux development, for example, uh, you might be used to setting up a very similar thing, uh, but using the NFS or, uh, you know, network file system. Um, that is technically also possible, of course. So, uh, yeah, it's just that, um, you know, with um, uh, with a CPU command, it's a bit more natural and, you know, you don't need to set up a specific uh, directory for sharing or something. Uh, you can just ad hoc, in fact, use any directory you want. Uh, in the CPU world, that's called the so-called CPU namespace. So you can always say, hey, uh, this here is now my namespace. Now, whatever I want to run, I can do relative to this path here, for example, or, well, actually, you would just see everything uh, on the remote machine as if it was your local machine or vice versa. You would see the remote machine as if it was your local machine, actually. Um, yeah, it might sound a bit magical right now, but I will get to this uh, later on here. So, yeah, um, this is now a very nice application, uh, but yeah, it's not self-sufficient, of course. So. Yeah, it's made for Linux, uh, which means we need a Linux system in the first place. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to use Linux boot, um, which is mainly just a concept. So the idea of Linux boot is you take a Linux kernel and use that for your bootloader environment. Now, what does a bootloader environment mean? Well, typically you would have something that you could interact with um, where you could just tell it to, you know, use some sort of resource uh, to continue the boot process. So that would usually be your, um, you know, the local storage devices that you have available, like a USB drive, SD card, and so on. Uh, or it could also be the network. So you could say, hey, uh, bootloader, you know, whatever the bootloader would be called at this point, uh, boot over the network. Um, and then of course you may want to set things up first, like, I don't know, DHCP or, you know, some Wi-Fi if it's a laptop machine and so on. And this is what we intend to do with the Linux boot project. In effect, it's already in, uh, in use in uh, 
quite some places. Um, yeah, if you are curious about that, uh, people have given talks on Linux boot. If you could just go to the linuxboot.org website, uh, at the very bottom, um, there are some talks reference and also the repositories and so on. Um, yeah, but there have also been additional talks. So I have given some which are not yet even listed on the website. Uh, I guess I should file a pull request for that. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, you, you will definitely find a bunch of resources. You know, if you search I don't know, on your favorite search engine or directly on YouTube where, uh, you know, you find many recordings. Um, yeah, you, you can find lots of things. But yeah, we will just keep this as the underlying concept. And we're going to do exactly what you see down here. Um, so we're now going to use the Orboot stub that we created last time where, you know, we could uh, start running from SRAM. Um, I will show you a few things I've changed now so uh, that I could actually continue with the boot flow. Um, then we will, uh, via uBoot, uh, run Linux boot eventually. So it means um, we're going to run this path here. So we're coming from uBoot SPL. Um, SPL means secondary program loader here. Uh, never mind that acronym, it's not very really relevant right now. It's the environment from which we can eventually load a kernel like Linux. So we're going to do this. And for that, I've prepared an image, which is a Linux kernel that includes, uh, let's zoom in here a bit. So that includes an initram file system. So that means, you know, uh, that's the environment where we have our binaries like the CPU daemon, for example, um, and also a few command line tools that will be a bit handy, I hope, like, you know, the common ls and cat and so on commands that, you know, from many Unix and Unix-like systems. Um, and so we're not going to run this path here. We're not going to boot into another operating system. So yeah, that is something you can do, right? So from the Linux kernel, you can execute another Linux kernel. Uh, or Windows or whatever you want it, or, you know, Plan 9 or FreeBSD or whichever. Um, yeah, that's what we're, what we're going to do. We're going to stay within this uh, initram file system and we're going to spin up the CPU daemon. Um, and hopefully we will be able to connect over the network. Now the network means I also need to have a bit of a network setup. Um, for which I'm using, you know, one of these uh, fancy <laughs> USB 3 uh, Ethernet uh, thingy. So, you know, I've already uh, attached all of this here. So I have a bunch of cables uh, lying around here. Um, so yeah, in, in theory it works. And in practice, we will need to see if the uh, Linux boot image that I have now is sufficient. And that will mostly boil down to the uh, Linux boot configuration. Um, so that's especially the drivers included. Uh, I have built for the correct architecture. That's <laughs> what I can tell so far. Uh, but if you recall, you know, just having, uh, you know, very, very little documentation, uh, we might need to uh, yeah, figure things out a bit regarding the drivers needed. So, yeah, one, one of the issues is that if I wanted to build a Linux kernel for a specific purpose like this one here, um, I would prefer to only use the drivers that I really need uh, for a few reasons. One reason is I would just want to have uh, you know, the bare minimum so that I can build it quick again, uh, but also that I don't need to transfer much, right? So if I want to transfer it over the network, uh, every megabyte, you know, can cause one or more seconds uh, to add up to uh, the uh, speed of, you know, just iterating over uh, different variants and so on. So yeah, we will have to see. Um, as a fallback, if it doesn't work uh, with booting over network, uh, I also have the kernel image on an SD card. Yeah, we will see if that works. Um, so yeah, so much about that for the introduction. Um, I have a small application here. Uh, this will be something that we will use for testing CPU eventually. Uh, I just call it Hello Linux Risk 564, whatever. Um, <laughs> I've actually extended this to also run on, uh, you know, ARC64. Uh, well, basically all the ARM, so ARM32 and ARM64. Uh, it also runs on x86. You know, there is a few feature flags. That's something uh, we can easily do in Rust. Um, yeah, but we're going to focus on this. And I even put the instruction down here to uh, run this over CPU with also a link to the CPU repository. Um, yeah, depending on your setup, the command might be a bit shorter and so on. 
Uh, but yeah, essentially you would say, you know, CPU. Um, yeah, if you need a specific one, you would pass your key. Um, then you would uh, run, you know, target host and your command to run. So in Rust, you know, we have this output directory called target in which we have uh, nested further down uh, the application that we build. And uh, one more thing that I'm also going to need probably is, um, you know, I would just increase the time out for uh, 9P, which is really just the transfer protocol, uh, you know, for uh, sending over uh, the binaries that we're going to run there. Uh, yeah, which, you know, just happens on the fly. Um, yeah, so much about that. Now there is um, the pull request that I just drafted a while ago already. Uh, this one here. Um, we're, you know, we're just hacking on things. Uh, this is essentially what you've seen on the stream thus far. And there is now a readme that I just created, um, which describes how you can now use the uh, Vision 5 and run via Orboot uh, from SRAM. So, yeah. Now, this is the um, setup I created. I have two uh, UARTs uh, that I need to connect to, right? So one of them uh, runs at baud rate 9600. So, uh, and it's actually the same UART as uh, we discovered. So uh, this here is what we're using for um, bringing Orboot over to the other uh, machine, so to the Vision 5 board. Um, so there, there is a tool that we're using for that. Uh, yeah, if you haven't seen it, just watch the recording of the previous stream. And then we're going to use Minicom again, just because I'm more used to it, uh, running at the, uh, you know, just default 115, 200 baud rate. Um, yeah, if you have configured any other defaults, uh, I mean, you probably know. Uh, but yeah, what you can see here is this is my other USB serial adapter that I'm using here. Um, this is what I connected to the uh, second header on the Vision 5 board. And so what we uh, now need to do in Orboot is, uh, once we start running uh, from here on the first header, uh, we're going to switch the baud rate to 115.200, and we're going to switch to uh, the other header. with a, So we have the same UART, uh, then transfer to another header on the board. Um, yeah, so why do we do this? Well, essentially because the uh, vendors from where components that we're going to continue with, which is the DRAM in it and, you know, U-boot and so on, um, they expect to be running at 115.200 anyway. Now, if we do this on the same header, the problem is, you know, um, I would need to uh, switch on the same uh, USB serial adapter that I have connected to that header. Uh, and that doesn't really make sense. So, yeah, I'm, ju I'm just using two of them and switching over. And yeah, so the tools that we're using uh, for that is the JH71XX tools repository that you also see here in this pull request, uh, or well, in the README that I created in this uh, pull request. Okay, so um, this here is what I've scripted up now. Uh, I made a small script called run.sh. Uh, that's essentially the command that you are seeing down here. Um, this here. Yeah, it's, it's slightly different because I split this up a bit. Um, but yeah, essentially uh, it's doing the same thing. Yeah, it's also running uh, make. So uh, let's actually do this now. Um, so here you see, uh, I've already run this uh, just before. Um, so let me do this again. And for that, I will just clear this down here. Yeah, this can stay. So in the middle uh, on the side here, uh, this here is where we are connected to the debug header at 9600 baud. Um, that's the, um, yeah, the debug header on the board. And down here we're connected, uh, you know, using the baud rate 115 200 uh, to the uh, 40 pin header. You know, the thing that you also know from the Raspberry Pi. So, okay, we're going to run the script now. Um, let's have a quick look again. So it's just like uh, I mentioned. Uh, well, let's actually zoom in because people were saying it was a bit hard to see sometimes on the stream. Okay, so yeah, uh, this is what I just showed you in the repository. We're running make. So with make, we're building uh, the Orboot binary, um, which results in having this file here. Uh, we call it boot blob. So this is the first binary that we're executing. And then we're going to use the JH7100 recover tool from the tools repository I just uh, uh, told you about and 
Then we're going to use the USB zero device. This is my first USB zero adapter and we're going to tell it to use our uh, Orboot boot blob as the recovery binary. So in this sense, we're not using it for recovery, but to enter the regular boot flow. So yeah, what we're doing in Orboot now is, uh, you know, what I just described to you, um, we're just going to enable a few things uh, and then continue executing uh, with a specific offset in the spy flash. And that's where the DRAM starts, uh, the DRAM init code, uh, you know, and then, you know, we'll just enter the regular uh, vendor execution flow. So uh, let's run. Um, now it's uh, waiting for me to press the boot mode button again. So I'm doing that now. Okay, now it's transferring it over X modem. Uh, and you already saw this down here, it says do whatever. And now it's, um, you know, just waiting for you if you want to interrupt the process down here. And there we go, we're already in the U-boot environment. Now let me scroll up a bit because it was really quick. So yeah, this is where we started. Uh, it says, welcome to Orboot. Um, syscon start and done. So this is the system configuration where we did a few changes. Um, now for a check, we're reading a few uh, things here. So uh, 1800 quad zero uh, at this memory address, um, we actually have our own binary, uh, that one here. So this is where the SRAM starts. And now in two seven zeros, this is where the spy flash starts. So this here is, um, you know, what I last flashed to uh, the uh, spy flash. Uh, and that was, you know, using the recovery tool, um, you know, with the recovery binary that we also experimented with in the first streams. Now, um, the next interesting thing here, uh, the order is a bit uh, confusing maybe, is this here. So this here is the DRAM blob and it starts with a few bytes this year. Uh, this is four bytes and those four bytes uh, describe the size of the binary. Um, it's actually up until here. Now the order of the bytes needs to be reversed and I'm also printing it down here. So if you read backwards, byte for byte, we have 00, 0155 FO. That's exactly this value here. Um, or if you, you know, if you want to uh, have it in the decimal notation, let's use my favorite calculator again, Node.js, it's about 87 and a half kilobytes, right? Okay, so now after the size, uh, we will have the actual binary starting. So that would be this here. So if we just skip the first uh, four bytes, you know, we, we get this here. So this is essentially the same thing. And this is where we now continue executing. Um, but yeah, the uh, current code is actually copying that again to SRAM. Uh, I'm not sure if that's even necessary. We may even, uh, you know, just do the execution right there in place. Um, we can experiment with that. Uh, but anyway, what you can see is uh, after saying jump to blah de blah, we're now getting this output down here, uh, DDR and so on. And this is already from the DRAM init code. So yeah, indeed that's running. Now um, it's done at this point here and it says your C check passed. So this is for, you know, checking the next binary if I remember correctly. And the next binary would then be open SBI. Now here it says bootloader. So yeah, if you recall, I already told you like essentially every stage is a bootloader again, you know, because it just means, well, what does it mean to bootload? Uh, it just means you load a binary and continue booting with it. So yeah, um, every stage you do that uh, can be seen as a bootloader. So yeah, and that's in the uh, broadest sense. In a more narrow sense, we would expect a bootloader to be more like interactive, you know. Um, and allow the user to actually interfere and say, hey, no, I actually want to load something different and so on. Uh, but yeah, I mean, depending on the platform, you may also want to have a different constraint and say, hey, no, we only allow for one execution flow. Yeah, in a very high assurance or a security uh, sensitive environment, you might need to do that. Now there is um, something interesting here. It says GPIO restart and it failed. Uh, I don't know what that's about. I don't really mind right now. Um, 
it could be that it's a bit confused because we're you know changing the state of the platform to something else than uh, the vendor firmware would do. Anyway, um, yeah, it's continuing with the output that we've already seen before and then handing over to U-Boot again, uh, which is still the very same image uh, that was already on the board initially. Um, this is from March 2022, as it seems. Yeah, whatever, it's um, as I received it uh, when I received the board. Um, yeah, it's dumping a few more things like details on the spy flash, for example. Uh, then we have the Ethernet's MAC address. Uh, this is something I'm going to copy now uh, for later. Uh, let's make a CPU directory for that actually. Uh, and I'm going to write a hosts file. More on that later. I'm just dumping this as a note. So yeah, it continues and it says MMC, CDS, whatever, switch to partitions. Okay. But yeah, it looks like I cannot give it any output or something. I don't know what's up with that. Um, yeah, it might be that it's actually not interactive at this point. Uh, because we made a change to the platform. So yeah, one thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to reset the board. So we're going to, uh, instead of our boot, we're going to run the vendor firmware again. So the uh, infamous second boot. And uh, yeah, you know, the one we modified to say boot loader. And now this might end up in a bit of a different state. Um, yeah, indeed. So yeah, we can interact with this now. Uh, it also says fail to load something. That is not an issue though. So yeah, it's looking for a file just by convention. Uh, you know, you could put something on an SD card uh, that describes a few environment settings for U-Boot. Uh, yeah, we don't mind that right now. Um, and yeah, I was looking for partitions for some reason. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, we're going to try this. So on this uh, SD card, I actually don't have partitions. Um, I don't know if U-Boot even supports that. Uh, if it doesn't, yeah, we'll have to see a bit, uh, maybe find a bit of a different solution. Um, so let's first try to see uh, if we can uh, even uh, interact with the SD card. So there is uh, the MMC command. So you can say MMC list that will list the MMC devices. Okay, it does find an SD card. Um, now what can you do? You can say MMC info uh, of the current MMC device. Uh, uh, I guess the selected one will be zero, but I don't know if we need to actively select it. Okay, so that looks nice. Uh, 3.6 gigabytes, that also makes sense. So a four gigabytes card, uh, the manufacturer, I don't know what this is supposed to mean. Uh, it's Intenso. So, you know, one of, one of those you can just buy anywhere in a supermarket or something. Um, okay, so let's see if we can load a file from it. So what does loading a file mean? Uh, now we need to interact with the file system. So in U-Boot, there is something called FAT load, FAT LS and so on. FAT, the file allocation table is, you know, a very uh, simple and common file system. Uh, back from the old days, let's say. Now what? Uh, what we're going to do first is we're going to see if we can actually list something. So we're going to say dev part directory. So dev will be, I presume, because I don't remember, uh, I guess it's like MMC zero. Now we're going to say slash. Okay, it doesn't find partition MMC zero. Okay. Uh, can we say fat ls slash? No, it doesn't find, okay. It definitely wants a partition, as it seems, uh, which is a bit strange. I don't know. Here it looks like the partition would be optional. Uh, is it like zero, zero? I don't know. Can't find this partition. Yeah, that is a bit unfortunate. So yeah, I'm not too familiar with this environment because I'm not using it much. Um, and that's also a reason 
uh, while we're going with um, Linux boot because it's you know more familiar to most people. So if you've done anything in Linux before, uh, you will just be able to help yourself at this point here, right? So you would know how to mount things, you would know how to list things, right? So you would just say, I don't know, mount whatever, slash dev slash mmc blk0 to slash mnt and then ls slash mnt and you know you would be done with this at that point um so uh let's let's see i mean we don't want to give up too quick uh there is no dash, dash h is there help fat ls this part from dev on interface in the directory oh is it like fat ls and then we say the interface shall be MMC, MMC, and then zero. Oh, look, yeah, that works. Okay, now we got it. Um, right, so we have this file image, and image is now the uh, Linux boot image that we, um, yeah, that I just put on the card. So what we're now going to do is we're going to fat load. Once again, I'm not familiar with this command, so we're going to look at the help. Um, so we would say fat load interface dev part whatever so it's very similar to what we've done before and now we're going to need to use this here adder the address um, we're going to tell the address to load the file to now the problem is what address do we need to use uh, we're going to use a dram address um, so you know, in DRAM, we have enough space for Linux. Now, of course, uh, we would need to remember uh, where the DRAM starts. So let me actually shrink this down here again uh, and go back to our nodes. So nodes.md, this here. Uh, this is where I noted down where, you know, different uh, memory addresses start. So this here was the SRAM and here we have DRAM. So uh, yeah, we're going to go with uh, 8020 for zeros. Uh, we're going to say fat load 8020 whatever. And then we're going to load image. Now image is just, you know, uh, a regular binary. Let's hope that this will actually work. Okay, that looks fine. Um, this is about 20 megabytes, right? Or well, 22, 21.8 something. Um, and now we're going to execute this address. Uh, we're going to use the boot m command, so boot from memory. Uh, that's what it's for in uroot. And we're just going to use the very same address again, 8020 and then quad zero. And hopefully we're going to see output from a Linux kernel. If not, um, we're going to need to figure out things again. Uh, for example, there might be a device block necessary in addition to the kernel. I'm not sure about that. Uh oh, wrong image format for boot m command. Now, why is that? So, um, uboot also has its own image format, the u image format. I'm not sure if we need this here. So that would be you know a small extra header around the uh, image file that we have. So we could, uh, you know, we could just um, wrap this header around the uh, kernel, you know, using uh, some tools that I also have on my laptop here. Um, or we see what else we have to offer. So we can also say, uh, huh, you see, lots of boot commands. So there is boot m. I guess boot m, if I remember correctly, maybe that uh, requires the u image format. So let's see, boot m. Uh, yeah. Oh, look at this. There is lots of things uh, you can uh, give in addition to the address. Boot application image stored in memory. When booting a Linux kernel, which requires a flat device tree, a third argument is required, which is the address of the device tree blob. To boot the kernel without an initRD image, yeah, uh, that's what we're doing. Use a dash for the second argument. Okay, so we need to do this. Um, yeah, there is now also multi-component view image format. It's called fit. Uh, not to con confuse with fit or fit. So 
Yeah, this acronym is uh, used in a few different contexts. Um, yeah, this is like, I guess, firmware image something. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Intel also has something called FIT. I think it's like firmware interface table or something. I forgot. Um, yeah, and then it exists in a few other places again. So yeah, it's not very search engine friendly. Uh, that's what I'm saying here. You know, and if you've been working already in the firmware space, and you know, we're we're talking about the same same domain in a sense, right? Um, you already run into acronym collisions all the time. Anyway, so yeah, I think this will uh, require a U image format. Okay, so we can do that. We can wrap the kernel in a U image, and then also copy over the device tree. So yeah. There is also something else we can do. So there is the uh, boot i command. Okay, so boot i uh, includes boot Linux flat or compressed image, flat or compressed. So it will probably uh, check whether it's a compressed image or not. So I guess we can also just say boot i here. And we're probably not going to see anything uh, because we don't have an FDT. Um, okay, so we can probably just use this here. Now, I don't have the FDT on the uh, SD card yet. We will see about this. Uh, yeah, let's just see what happens. If it doesn't work, uh, it doesn't work. So it says device tree not found or missing FDT support. Good. So we're going to repeat this again. And of course, we're going to reset the platform for that. Uh, and I'm going to uh, plug the SD card now into my laptop. So, yeah, done. Um, by the way, if anyone is in the chat, I don't see anything from the chat today. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've done anything wrong here, but in OBS Studio, at least it says that I'm streaming. So that sounds good. Uh, let me just quickly recheck. So on twitch.tv. Uh, yeah, there is also a few other people I watch sometimes. So this here would be me. Um, and then there is also this dashboard thing. So I guess the dashboard should show that I'm currently streaming. Yeah, it says you're live. That is good. Oh, well, I have followers. Uh, <laughs> get five people chatting at the same time. Woo, okay. Um, can I see the chat of my current stream anywhere here? I have no clue. I haven't done that much. Manage stream. Yeah, management sounds good. Uh, yeah, now I'm seeing myself. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, hi, DRAM4. Okay, now, okay, I also see an OBS Studio now, so all good that I'm going to close this. Okay, cool. So, um, Linux. Uh, this is what I've done earlier. Um, we're now going to also copy a device tree blob. And so we're going to use the DTS uh, star five. Uh, we're now going to use the DT uh, B or the device tree blob, uh, blob from the uh, previous Starlight board uh, from you know Beagle board. The Beagle five Starlight was the first uh, Beagle five board um, uh, or, or Beagle bone board that was uh, made for the. Uh, or, or was using the risk five platform anyway so yeah uh, let's copy this uh, and you mount the SD card yeah, as I told you it's an intenso and let's see if that works now so I'm going to hit reset on the board um, yeah it will do its dance in the meantime uh, yeah you can already see CPU failing to connect here <laughs> um, yeah I tried a few things like I have this virtual machine here running, for example, which I'm using for uh, just experimentation. And here I have this QMU script, uh, which I'm going to check on now real quick because, yeah. Um, this should uh, bind the port 23 to 4711. And now that I'm looking at this here, I haven't actually run the CPU daemon, so yeah, I'm going to do this here now, and then we can use this to uh, come back to later. 
All right, so here we are again. Um, so what did we need to do? We needed to say fat load MMC zero. Now the name of the image, uh, no, the address to use. So that would be 80, 20, lots of zeros. And then the file name, that looks like it's working. So it's doing its thing. We're going to use the same command again with the DTB. Uh, where of course I haven't remembered the file name. Uh, yeah, this uh, tremendously long string here. Let's actually say ls instead of ls-l. Good, now I can copy this more easily. Okay, so um, yeah, maybe I will just give it a different name at some point. We're going to use a very high address for this, um, just so that we don't run into the kernel. Would, okay, that does not seem to work. Oh, yeah, because we just need the file name. Yeah, I have it on the root. Okay, that looks good. Um, six kilobytes sounds reasonable. A device tree isn't that huge after all. And so now we say boot i, this address dash, because we don't have the init rd, and then this address. And we're going to add this to our nodes because I cannot possibly remember this all the time. So this is now uh, Linux boot from SD card. Um, yeah, I should actually contribute this to your nodes DRAM forever because that's uh, <laughs> not yet in there. Um, but yeah, it will definitely help people get along. So um first command uh load the image second command uh the real thing um load the device tree blob and then boot let's see if it works starting kernel i'm not seeing anything here uh yeah that's a shame well at least we tried um yeah, I, I'm very sure it's not about the image format because it's not complaining now. Uh, and I guess it would just see if there is a compressed image. So probably we could just give it the image.gz also. So Linux always um, also builds compressed images uh, when you build an image. You know, by default, you would also have image.gz uh, for the RISC five platform. For other platforms, you know, it might differ a bit. Um, yeah, anyway, that is not going anywhere. Um, which might be due to the device trip blob. So we're going to try at least one thing now. Um, so I put a link here in, uh, in the notes. So this here is the Linux uh, fork uh, from Star5. And somebody was just so nice recently to add some instructions here. Uh, and if we look uh, in the commits, uh, there is also a dev config and a DTS. So there is a full JH7100, Starlight, whatever, um, this year. So we are going to uh, download this file. Uh, do we, oh, wow. Oh, wow. There is, there is a bunch going on here. Okay. So we're not going to download this file. Uh, instead, we're going to download this patch here. And we're going to apply it to my local copy of Linux. Um, yeah, in the meantime, I will just turn off the board because it's always getting so warm for whatever reason. So, uh, patch, patch, dash P1, 1, 8, whatever. Um, I guess this will apply. If it doesn't, no idea. Uh-oh, of course, that didn't work. That is a shame. Uh, that was the only thing I could assume would fail. So this is the like DTSI is like an include file. So essentially it's, you know, like a template that you would extend with um, or, or you would uh, be based on for uh, writing a specific device tree for a file. Um, and we're going to use NeoVim now. So I just, you know, switch from Vim to NeoVim again uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and let's see, where do we have the collisions? Do we even have many collisions? So it looks like it's mostly collision. 
no wait um, most of the hunks actually applied. Yeah, right. So this here is not like, okay, instead of using the patch command, you know what? Uh, we're going to say, uh, get stash and get stash drop. Uh, instead of using the patch command, we're going to say git am. Uh, so this will also apply the patch. Uh, and of course, uh, some things that already exist uh, will not work. So, okay, we're going to abort this uh, and do it the brutal way. So I'm going to just uh, remove this directory, check out the directory. And if you're using the modern git commands, I don't know how to use them, so I don't care. Uh, git status, now we're on a clean state again. Uh, we're going to git am the patch again and we're getting the same collisions um, but now I can actually edit this file and I will see the collisions there uh, because of the way that uh, git presents them which is a bit different from the regular patch command I think or don't I wait am I looking at the right file even so we're going to look at this here, and then patch does not apply. Huh, maybe, maybe git am actually does something similar to uh, whatever. I don't know. Oh, it says show current patch equals diff to see the failed patch. Okay, yeah, let's just follow the uh, hint in a different color. Sounds very intriguing. Okay, great. So. Now, what's the problem here? Where do I see the failing part? This looks like everything. Huh. I have no idea. Okay, uh, let's have a look again here. Maybe they have some other patch uh, that I could just apply prior to this one and then it would be fine. Um, DRM, whatever. Oh, I guess they have a few things which will not apply to me. DT bindings. Uh oh. oh too much things going on here. So yeah, they have applied a bunch of patches which which I guess are not in upstream Linux. So I'm using um a slightly diverging kernel, so mine is based on uh another kernel that we forked for that Samuel Holland forked from the uh, upstream Linux kernel on, you know, kernel.org and then applied another few patches for the uh, D1 uh, SOC from all winner. So that's yeah the other thing I'm also working on sometimes. Yeah, at some point when you're juggling with too many kernels, you know, um, gets a bit confusing and so on. So what I wanted to do though is I wanted to look at the history here. So I'm going to say browse files. I'm going to browse to this directory. Uh, I want to see the history for the directory where we have these device trees and so on. Uh, RISC five, boot, DTS, uh, star five. There, history. Great. So, oh, look at this. Ah. So, this is what I'm after. Now, let's see what patches I have so far. Uh, let's abort this again. Um, I'm going to move this patch to something, uh, I don't know, let's say 005, whatever. Uh, I guess we will have a few patches before that. Um, now I want to see what else changed in the DTS directory. So I want to see all the patches there. Uh, this will take a while because I'm using TIG and TIG is not perfectly performant for that, but yeah, whatever. So yeah, you can see uh, these are the D1 related patches there. Okay, uh, let's see what else we got. So. Yeah, oh, and you also see this is already on Linux 5.19, which is currently a release uh, candidate. So, um, 
Yeah, the problem with these commit messages is that sometimes uh, they can be a bit uh, not so specific, let's say. Uh, what is renamed the node name of DMA? Is that for all the device trees in RISC V? No, this is only for the Sci-5 FU540. So it doesn't even apply for us. Um, what else do we see here? Let's maybe start at the bottom because we already have a few uh, things which are related to the star five, right? Uh, sci five, sci five. Where do we have star five? Let's search. Star. I don't find star. Is it case sensitive? I think star. Oh, look. There. So, yeah, this is for the JH7100. This is something beta device something. Let's see if we have that here as well. Okay, that would be here. And now the uh, next patches are that one, that one, that one, that one. So this will be 0, 1, 2, 3, um, 5. We could also start counting at 1. I don't really mind. Okay, so we're going to download this one. Uh, wget. Um, we're going to say dash o. So this will be. Uh, I don't even know how many digits I used. So this thing dot patch. I was going to put dot patch here. Huh. Okay. Um. Next one is. Uh, this really sucks right now. I could also, you know, use git to add this as a remote and then cherry pick from there. It might even be faster, but yeah, it's, there is so much in the nose kernel that it takes a bunch of time anyway. So I don't really mind that too much. Uh, let's actually do this here. So I will go here. I will say this dot patch this dot patch. Go back again and do the same with the next one. So we're going to use wget dash o, but this is now 002 dash bloody blah dot patch. Oh. Yeah, I wish you could control everything, uh, you know, in a sensible manner with your keyboard these days, but yeah. Uh, some people working on interfaces like user interfaces think otherwise, it seems. So, wget dash o, this is now 003 dot patch dot patch. Uh oh. Do I have a file dot patch now? Whatever I did there. Oh, what the heck is this here? Ah, oh, fancy. I accidentally put a space somewhere here. Um, yeah, whatever, it looks fine. So I'm going to say git am uh, 000 something, 001 something, and so on. Git am triple zero. Ha, huh. applying, okay. Git am 001. I know I can also do this in a batch, but I forgot how. Uh, git am 003, git am 005. Great. Okay, I'm going to rebuild this. So we need to cross compile here, right? So I already set this up here. Um, I tried using the Vision 5 Freedom Toolchain at some point here. It doesn't work, of course. So this is now with the upstream kernel. So I'm using this here for actually compiling. So you see this here is commented out. That would be from the Freedom tool chain. Um, now that one here is the uh, tool chain I got from just stock Ubuntu or well, pop OS here, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, we need to say arc equals risk five because I'm on x86 here, so it knows what to use. Um, yeah, I'm going to just use a ton of resources for uh, that. And it doesn't really matter because all we're going to see is now rebuilding the device tree and nothing else changed. So when I run build at this age, oh, it's running into problems. Great. Okay, so yeah, in, in theory, this could have worked. 
Okay, what's the problem here? DT bindings reset store 5J HM100. So what we're going to do is uh, we don't care about audio. We're just going to comment out audio. I don't want to waste time on this. Okay, so we're going to use NeoVim. Uh, audio, audio. I guess something is also referencing audio then. Yeah, now we got a syntax. Why is that a syntax error? Wait, what? How is there a syntax error now? I don't really understand device trees too much. I mean, roughly, conceptually, I do, but yeah, um, we need to get used to it. So yeah, one thing you always need to keep in mind is device trees are um, designed for a monolithic concept, right? So whatever you put in a device tree uh, describes for your uh, target, whatever kernel or something, or you boot can also use device tree. It describes something, um, in a very, you know, uh, human readable manner and so on. But it means the uh, other side um, would need to understand the very specific ex expression that you're using. So if you call something uh, whatever, you know, the other, uh, other side needs to know how to pick up whatever and make something out of it. Uh, and, you know, the drivers to bind to and so on. So you always need to say like, I don't know, compatible equals something. And that's how you, uh, you know, like this here. Uh, that's how you actually know what platform you're on and so on. Okay, so uh, 273, syntax error. 273, clocks equals. Okay, so I'm not including, so this here is I2S, this is something for audio, uh, which we're not including now. And now it's saying it's a, uh, it's a syntax error, but it doesn't really make sense because syntactically, um, you know, this would always be valid uh, in a sense, uh, but now it's not valid because it doesn't have some, some of this stuff like uh, the audio clock here. So, yeah, this is a bit um, of an issue with, uh, you know, the device tree language. Anyway, so we don't need this. There is some other re uh, reference to audio uh, and another one. So why does... I guess the syntax highlighting is broken here. Anyway, we're going to uh, just uh, spdiv dmic. I forgot what dmic is, but we're going to uh, comment out all of this stuff here. Now we're going to wonder uh, why it stopped here somewhere. No, it actually didn't. Okay, that was really just the syntax highlighting. So we're going to build again and what we what do we get? 493. Uh, PW. Uh, yeah. 493. Uh, you are the one. Uh oh. Huh. 493. No, oh, this is something about interrupts. Did I get this right? Okay, uh, JH7100 common DTSI 493. Label or path PWM DAC not found. Are we looking at the same line 493? Because this year it's saying uh, interrupts JH7100 DTSI. JH7100. Oh. No, that's a. Ah, there. Okay, this is a different file. Okay, so you can also. Uh, I guess this also references the other DTSI. So there is like, oh, what the heck? So there is this one DTSI, there is this one DTSI. So I guess this builds on top of that one. Uh, okay, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so what do we find here? What was it? Line 493, 493, go. Uh, yeah. Was it necessary to comment that out? Whoa. Okay, this is um, referencing the audio clock. Okay, so we need to we need to comment this out. Yeah, we don't need this now anyway. Okay, so that looks better. Uh, what else? 
there is the 398. This is now again in the other DTSI, of course. So down here, 398. Yeah, so sound, whatever, we don't care. Uh, we're also going to comment out codec. We don't. We're going to comment out the entire block here. So instead of sound as a D card, uh, actually we, yeah. Let's actually let's actually end the comment after after this year. So that would be here. Or not? Oh, that was sound. Okay, so let's see again. Um, four oh seven, four oh seven, four oh seven. Uh, syntax error here. Uh oh, oh, because huh, there is a comment in here which also says PWM deck. Now, if this were Rust, it would work because Rust allows for nested block comments so yeah um then we're going to do this here we're going to replace this with a single line comment fixed okay uh we're done compiling um i will use the sd card again for transferring the dtb and at this point it already feels like i should probably do this over the network um but yeah whatever so what do we need to do uh we copy the dtb but we're not going to use the starlight we're going to use the uh vision size v1 uh there what was the name vision size something this year okay yeah technically i don't have to unmount because i waited long enough but you never know better always unmount i know people who had issues where you know they forgot that part so um now we're about to approach the end of the stream in a bit so uh we haven't gotten too far which is a bit of a shame um but yeah, we, we did get to some point. Maybe, maybe we will get to this point where now where we're now going to see Linux boot. Um, if not, I will. Oh, what's wrong here? Usage, MMC. Oh, we got the fat load. Okay, fat load. Okay, so we're just proofreading our notes here. Uh, fat load. Fat load and booty or boot eye, boot image, starting kernel. No, we're not seeing anything. <sighs> okay, so yeah, I mean, one more thing. Uh, as I told you, I don't have the uh, very same kernel the vendor does. So I wanted to be smart enough to prepare something, but apparently the mainline kernel is not very suitable here. Or maybe it is and we need to pass something else. Um, like a command line, for example. Do we have a command line? Uh, okay, let, let's just do this real quick. So this is something we can also try. So we're going to say command line. Um, UFI run, oh, who needs UFI? So UFI is legacy, right? We don't use this anymore. We're using uh, Linux boot nowadays. UFI is also way too complicated uh, and error prone to set up and so on. And if, you, if you've been watching the news, um, there are so many vulnerabilities in the vendor firmware uh, based on UFI discovered now, which, you know, in part are just design flaws within UFI. Anyway, um, what do we do? We're going to say console equals TTY as zero. Huh, I'm not sure if that will be sufficient. Um, Anyway, so this means I will need to rebuild my kernel. Uh, we can technically also pass the, um, well, we, we, we can actually, we can also pass the command line from uboot. So yeah, I will show you how that works. 
I actually didn't want that. Oh, come on. Okay. I wish you could just say return and it would just continue. Uh, I don't really want to have this timeout. I mean, it's good to have the timeout for interacting, but if I don't want to interact, I would like to just skip it. Okay, so we're going to use the same commands again. Um, and then we're going to look at env, the uh, boot environment. So the environment is like, uh, you know, lots of environment variables. And at some point there should be a uh, command line thing. So it's just called a bit different here. Um, what do they call it again? Uh, my memories are fainting. Um, yeah. I would probably recognize it if I saw it. Um, ah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't recognize it. Okay. So, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some notes I did for some other hack project where, you know, uh, I already did a lot with U-Boot. So this is in my orange CMS repositories and it's called ARM CPU. So I did things with ARM on the, um, with the CPU and the ARM platform. Right. So boot arcs, this is what we're looking for. And boot arcs, print and boot arcs, uh oh, boot arcs not defined. So we're going to say set and boot arcs, and we're going to say console equals tty as zero. Now we have boot arcs. Okay, so we've already loaded the kernel image. I'm not sure about the DTB, uh, it doesn't hurt to load it again. And uh, we're going to booty again, and hopefully we're going to see some output. No, we don't. What a shame. Okay, so let's um, resort to the fallback plan, uh, which is what I uh, prepared the below thing for. Oh, look, uh, CPU exited, shut down. Um, okay. Yeah, whatever happened here, I guess it's because of the resizing. It should, I don't know. Uh, output line suppressed due to rate limiting. Okay. Yeah, that could also be because it's a virtual machine. Um, I did type CPU D dash in. Okay, so this is the Alpha shell. Uh, that thing is also sometimes a bit of a troublesome thing. Um, yeah. Reset, clear, whatever. Uh, help. Yeah, that doesn't want to work, so we're just going to kill all QMU system risk five and restart the VM, and then I'm going to show you what should actually happen. So, now on the left hand side, we have U root. Uh, that's the environment that we're using. So we're now going to say CPU D dash init. Um, it's now going to do its automated network setup, whatever. Uh, this is now just coming from QMU. So I configured uh, QMU to have, uh, you know, this um, address range here. If you want to see it again, uh, here is the uh, QMU script. So I'm saying netdev user. So this is um, how you can give a network interface to the virtual machine. I'm going to bind uh, to my local uh, machines port 4711. Um, I'm taking the port 23 that is in the virtual machine. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to run a little uh, binary that I made uh, and another one that I made. So yeah, this now needs to also uh, get the port number. Uh, and yeah, we also have it here. So here we're going to say uh, CPU rv.sh. This is for the hello program I told you about earlier. So what this should do is now uh, it will just, you know, 
uh, check a few registers. So in, um, in RISC-V, there are a few registers uh, that are a bit special, uh, the so-called CSRs or control and status registers. And then there is also uh, a bunch of other uh, things I'm just reading out, like um, you know the CPU information, the memory information, and I forgot what. Anyway, uh, when this is done, uh, we should see some output. Now, because this is a virtual machine, this is now with QMU6. I haven't yet figured out to have, uh, how to have the KVM acceleration. Um, oh, wow. Oh, no, this is so unhappy. What is happening here? What is happening? I think we saw this earlier as well. Uh-oh. Huh. Yeah, invalid packing. I have no idea what is going on here right now. Um, that might be, might be, might be, because I'm actually not providing memory to the machine here uh, explicitly, right? So if you, sorry, if you look at the uh, QMU script file, I'm not saying anything about the size. So let's say, um, how do we supply memory again? Is it upper? No, lowercase m. Uh, we're going to give it a gigabyte of memory. Going to kill it again. And run it again. Yeah, I hope this will now uh, end up better. Um, if it doesn't, uh, it could also be because of the kernel configuration. Um, and if that remains an issue, uh, I still have another kernel uh, prepared for doing this. So this here is actually now the same kernel that I'm also trying to run on the Vision 5 board. Um, it's built for uh, multiple SOCs, so that includes QMU. Ah, look, now it works. Okay, yeah, it was really just the amount of memory. Um, is 822 whatever high enough in decimal looks enough for current. Yeah, right. So yeah, the address I was providing for the DTB is um, yeah, indeed more than uh, 30 megabytes uh, behind the Linux kernel or uh, well, 30 megabytes uh, starting from DRAM and the Linux kernel would start at like, I think two megabytes or something. Um, and with it's like 20 something, yeah, that would be definitely sufficient. Yeah, I don't know. Um, we'll get back to that at some point. Maybe I will just figure it out in the meantime. Okay, so now uh, you're seeing uh, how it works with CPU D. So I can just run a command that I have on my machine here. Now this is in the uh, target directory. Uh, this program is on my local machine and I'm running it uh, with the environment of the remote machine. So what this means is I'm now also seeing the information from the remote machine, which is the CPU info, uh, R64 IMA FTC and SV57, which means we have 57 bits for, uh, you know, the MMU space. So, you know, we can address up to two to the 57, whatever, uh, many, many uh, bytes or bits of memory. Um, it's actually bytes, so two to the 57 is many, many, many bytes. Um, yeah, total memory is the one, a gigabyte that we provided, right? So this here is, we do this in hex. Uh, I have a hex command, right? So this is not exactly uh, the one gigabyte because, you know, some parts are used for something else. Yeah, but it's roughly a gigabyte that we get for the system to use. I'm also printing the command line. So the command line is, oh, actually what we just built into the kernel. So we're saying console equals TTY zero. And apparently that doesn't mess up the uh, machine. So we're still seeing output here. Yeah, and this here is now the uh, commit hash that we're currently on. So uh, if we say uh, git show, you know, head, um, we should see the same thing. So dbab whatever, dbab whatever, that is exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, and that's all the program is doing. Now I have something else in the makings. I want to show that very quickly as well. Uh, I call it tboot because I'm building applications now with the uh, very nice toolkit called bubble T, where it's actually uh, not a toolkit. 
Uh, but it's a utility for building command line applications. And then they have something called bubbles, uh, which are the you know actual widgets and so on. So the bubbles make the toolkit, if you will. Um, and I'm going to use that to build a very nice and interactive bootloader. Uh, currently it's really, you know, just a very <laughs> crappy draft, uh, but you can already see it looks nice, right? So it's a bit more appealing with uh, colors and so on. It's interactive. So if you're used to end cursors, what, what I'm using for configuring the Linux kernel mostly, the menu config interface, um, yeah, that can be um, applicable to uh, some environments, but yeah, here it's likely not uh, going to be sufficient. So yeah, we're going to build something nice with this. Um, yeah, and I'm actually thinking of uh, using this for a more, uh, even more appealing uh, interface at some point, where if we were to put this on a screen where we have actual graphics, uh, we could still use a texture interface, um, but with a nice wallpaper in the background. So then it already looks very fancy. And if you look at your uh, laptops uh, or whatever uh, BIOS or, you know, the firmware setup, um, then you will also recognize it's really just mostly text and lists and, you know, scrolling through the lists and so on. So it's that simple. Yeah. Now you also see they have this nice thing here, a spinner, right? So we can also use that for asynchronous stuff like loading over a network, for example, that is very suitable here. Um, yeah, and whatever, you know, you, you can very easily just draft your applications. So if you're curious what this here is about, um, this is in the platform systems interface space on GitHub uh, and the repository is called uApps. Yeah, anyway, yeah, that's a lot of uh, work in progress stuff over there. Uh, nothing too exciting right now, but this is where I'm going to draft a few tools uh, that would also assist us here in the long term. Anyway, long story short, um, let's uh, finish up for today. So just for recap, we tried uh, to run a Linux kernel now on the Beagle 5, uh, sorry, not the Beagle 5, the Vision 5. Um, we first tried actually the Beagle 5 DTB, the device tree blob, um, and I tried to run a kernel that I built for um, uh, sort of supporting the SOC, but I guess it's not like fully the same. Oh, look. Now CPU decrash again. Yeah, whatever. It looks like it's related to the Elvis shell. I don't know. I don't really mind. Um, yeah, anyway. So yeah, that kernel, uh, after a few attempts and changes, um, did not get us any output. So what we resorted to was just using a virtual machine for uh, having a quicker look uh, or a closer look at the CPU tool. So yeah, you could see I can just uh, run anything in the environment that I have somewhere else, uh, but using my local binaries there. And yeah, I will see that I figure things out for the next stream, uh, which um, now will be in uh, three weeks because the next two weeks are a bit special. So uh, next week I will be in Berlin for a hack week uh, where we're going to look closer at the D1 SOC from all winner. Uh, there is a few other people also very interested in that from uh, another nice community. Uh, and then in the week after that, um, yeah, I will be out for a while. Uh, yeah, and then I will be back again. And hopefully by then I have figured out a few more things. Um, like how we would actually get output from uh, the Vision 5 port from Linux. Yeah, I will probably just use the other kernel tree and then see if that works. Uh, if that doesn't either, um, I don't know. You'll have to see a bit. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, I would say the um, next big step for Orboot would now be to actually build a second stage. So instead of the uh, open SBI and Uboot environment, uh, we would have our own environment based on Rust SBI and, you know, a few bits that we do in Orboot. Uh, but it might be that there are a few interesting specific things uh, that we need to set up for the platform. Um, so we already saw this, uh, you know, in the vendor code, there is always these like magic values. They're just writing arbitrary memory addresses uh, and putting some whatever values in there. Uh, and, you know, with a bit of experimentation, you can sometimes figure things out, but, you know, there are other things um, or it will be really hard to figure out things without proper documentation. Yeah. 
uh, which is a bit sad. So yeah, we will see how far we get. Anyway, thank you very much for today and uh, see you again in three weeks. And that will be, let's see, the uh, 10th of August. Until there, take care.